geologist. I've studied rocks and industrial minerals and construction materials in my career. It's led me down a path of working on issues that deal with concrete. I spent a quarter century in Master Builders Tech Center. That's in Cleveland. We sold admixtures. Those are specialty chemicals that help make concrete better, stronger, more durable. And in that situation with the sale, it, it also provides service to the customer. So if the brakes are low or they have other problems, they would send the material to me if they need to certify aggregates and so forth. And so that's what I did for a living. And so because they don't pay you to look at ultramafic lampophores, because there's no money in them, they pay you to look at concrete. And so that was how I made a living. And I taught at the University of Akron and now teach here. And I tell my students every day, every minute, geology is involved in your life, the materials of geology. So we're gonna go over some things about concrete that may be of interest and look at some things that we would see in more technical sense to diagnose problems that come up. This is a picture of a poslin mine. And a poslin is a powder we would add to concrete to make it stronger and more durable in the long run. Poslins include fly ash from coal plants, natural volcanic poslin like this material from Kirkland. These are materials that make concrete stronger and better and more durable. Something the Romans knew about and capitalized on. In the concrete world, there's a distinction to be made. A lot of people talk about cement and concrete interchangeably. In reality, there's a big difference. You'll see, let's see the pointer here. That truck up at the top is a cement truck. It's a hydraulic truck that hauls a powder and it gets pumped into silos at a plant. That's hauling Portland cement. Down here in Chicago is a concrete mixer. That's a truck that delivers fresh concrete to customers and building sites. And, and there's a distinction to make. Concrete is a product made of aggregates, cement, the powder in that truck on the top, and water, as well as some specialty chemicals. So it's a simple mix, it's a simple thing, but it's a tremendous achievement in man's building of civilization. So that's the distinction to make here between cement and concrete. Concrete is made with cement. A lot of people are concerned today about CO2 and rightly so. In this world, everybody's under the microscope to reduce CO2 to the atmosphere. My position is simple. In the embodied energy of concrete, it's way down on the bottom here. Concrete does not have a lot of embodied energy and a lot of CO2 footprint, maybe 5%. You'll notice on the right, the big problem isn't concrete. We can live with that. The big problem is the transportation and electric generation industry. The industries that use hydrocarbons that produce CO2 are really the lion's share. And in a world where we go to energy based on hydrogen, using solar energy instead of hydrocarbons like the carbon reservoir in coal, that at that point, this will be insignificant. The CO2 from Portland cement production may be 5% or so. And so we, we can live with that. So how did this material develop? What is concrete? How did it get to be what we know today? It started way, way back, even in the Greek times when they used the ash from Santorini volcano. That ash was a highly silicious supervolcano. And those high silica ashes make excellent poslins when they're fine grained. And so the Greeks used it, but nowhere but in Rome did it really come to a zenith. But the concrete the Romans used, you'll notice some structures like this one here are Roman concrete structures, but they're not concrete like we know today. The Roman engineers were brilliant and they discovered that at Pozzoli in Italy, there's a volcanic rock they could crush up and use the powder and the rock as aggregate 
and just activate it with dead burned lime. So they would take limestone and they would heat it. And the Roman engineers would check and make sure there was enough lime being used in the material. Because if they shorted on lime or they didn't burn it hot enough, it wasn't alkaline enough to activate that ash. And so they didn't use Portland cement. They used the pozzolanic reaction of activating volcanic ash with lime. And that was the strength building concrete that survives to this day. The modern concrete world began in England with Smeaton and then later Joseph Asbin. Asbin looked at a rock that was dirty limestone and he said, okay, I'm gonna heat this up and burn it and see if I mix it with water, what happens? And when he did that, it set, it was hydraulic. It set and made a, a cementitious product. And he, he looked at it when it was hardened and he said, well, this looks a lot like the rock, the limestone at Portland, the island of Portland. And that's where the name Portland cement came from. He got a patent, which you see on the right. And his patent was for a primitive form of Portland cement burned in a big upright bee kiln. And so that's how Portland cement really got started. It began in England, his, his patent in 1824. This aqueduct on the left is the result of Roman engineering. It's in France. It produced concrete that produced this was made from volcanic ash and volcanic rock. And it was activated with lime and it's still functioning today. I don't think it transports water now, but it's still standing and it's intact. And so the Poslanic reaction that made Roman concrete is the same thing we use now to make modern concrete, but we're using Portland cement instead of dead burn lime to activate things that will make gel. Concrete, yes, ma'am. Um, I was reading an article, uh, an archaeological article, and it was talking about concrete, and it was saying that they had just figured out the recipe that the Romans used for concrete, and one of those ingredients was they were using seawater instead of fresh water. Um, is, is this true? Yeah, you can use salt water in today's modern Portland cement concrete, and the Romans certainly could use seawater. And some of their concrete structures are actually seawalls in ports, and they're exposed to the ocean water and are very durable. So the Poslanic reaction works based on consuming Portlandite, which is the calcium hydroxide phase in the concrete, and it makes more of the calcium aluminum silicate gel. We're getting deep into science here but it makes them more of a glue that makes concrete the strong, valuable material it is. And so that poslanic reaction, when it's, it's the only thing happening in the Roman concrete, still makes a very strong hydraulic cement product. And using seawater introduces more sodium and those alkalis get bound into the gel. And so you can actually use salt water to make concrete. And people do that. It's better to use fresh water because alkalis can have some issues with some types of aggregates in terms of expansive reaction. And so we try not to do that, but you can. And that would, wouldn't have been a problem for Romans to make concrete with salt water too. This kiln on the right is an early kiln used in, in England to produce cement. That's Aspen's beehive kiln. And he literally cooked a dirty limestone. And by dirty, I mean it has some clay and some quartz silt and sand. Dirty means it's got more than just calcium carbonate, which is the prime ingredient in limestone. And that's what we need to make cement. We're placing concrete. So when we mix concrete today, we mix water, Portland cement, aggregates with some admixtures a variety of specialty chemicals, and we're producing a high quality product that's engineered for different uses. Here in Chicago, uh, Zynga's placing flat work here on a city sidewalk. And so the, the drivers can maneuver these big expensive trucks filled with usually 10 yards of concrete and put it right where they need it. And it's plastic so you can move it shape it and it sets 
and it hardens into the beautiful material we know as concrete. Not that things can't go wrong, but typically it works very well. In placing concrete, often the plastic concrete is pumped, as you see in the upper middle. You have to have form work, and the forms on the left are our residents in Chicago where they're ready to pump concrete into those forms. They have to be secure and well supported because there's a fair amount of weight with plastic concrete. It's shot into forms, into slabs on grade like this on the lower left. It's screeded in the middle bottom and leveled, and then it's finished with trowels. And it's a very simple thing, often on flat work, which is a slab on grade. On the right, you see this guy running a power troweler. And that's a float that has blades and it turns real fast. And he can literally push the cement grains down and densify the surface. It makes a very nice, hard, finished surface. So here we're placing concrete in Prescott. These guys are running their power float after they get it. They have to time it just right. If they don't, you can have a problem with delamination. And so it's a technically demanding field to mix properly, to place properly, and to cure and, and get the product to do what it should. Properly done, concrete is a, is a fantastic material, a very long and durable lifespan. It's a way better value for the taxpayers than asphalt. And we're moving, now that they're about the same price, we're moving toward more concrete pavements. Of course, concrete is critical to a modern world as it was even in Rome, New York City, bridge over the Rhine River. We're paving concrete streets with complex laser-driven pavers, and we make dams out of it. This one in the middle is from a precast plant up here in the top middle, where they're producing hollow core segments for buildings. When you put your hand in the curing concrete, you can cook the skin off your hand. It's so hot, the kiln heat from producing Portland cement is released when you mix it with water and concrete heats as it cures and sets. So what goes into concrete? Here are the ingredients. It's about two thirds aggregate. Aggregates are the most important industrial mineral in the non-metallic side. More dollars and more tons are produced of aggregates than anything else. And you see they're rounded. They're also manufactured or crushed. And you can see in hardened concrete down here with the ruler, that's what it looks like when you cut and polish it and begin looking at it in the lab. And so it's a mixture of aggregates mostly. And it's got paste. We call this paste. The matrix is a mortar with, with a sand grains in it. And we, we look at this under the microscope and we see particles in an index oil that show the nature of these materials. When we're looking at it forensically, we look at it. Portland cement is a gray powder. It's an amazing material. It's evolved into a very complex and significant material in society. And it's a very specific chemistry. It's been dialed in. And, and at Drake and at Clarkdale, we're making the same kind of material all the time. Generally, there's not a problem with cement. When you look at a piece of cement clinker, we call it clinker because it comes out of a big hot kiln and it rolls around like a magma and it's producing crystalline calcium silicates and a matrix. Those clinker grains look like this on the right. When you look at them under a microscope after they've been polished and etched, these are the calcium silicate grains here, the, the tricalcium silicate here, the dicalcium silicate, and the matrix is in between. This was literally a magma in a hot kiln produced by raw meal being fired up to about 15, 1600 degrees C. And so these, these clinkers are then ground with, with gypsum to control set, which makes the Portland cement we use. We also, of course, add water to concrete to set hydraulically the mix and to get it flowable, workable. And we use chemical admixtures. These are specialty chemicals, as I mentioned. They entrain air, and we need that for various reasons. They reduce the water content needed to make concrete. The more water you add and the less you cure the concrete, 
the weaker and less durable it is. So you have to add the right amount of water. And a big problem in our business is when the truck arrives at the site, the first thing the general manager does on the project is whistle. And he says, give me 10 gallons, give me 30 gallons. They, they add water to the truck. When the concrete arrives on the project, it's as designed. The producer doesn't want a problem. They don't want to call back. So the concrete is designed specifically for a certain amount of water, a certain amount of workability, and a certain durability of strength. And, and when the project engineer adds water on site, the driver does what he asks. That's how it works. And then the project engineer owns the load. And if he adds too much water, the durability goes down. So that's what the, the chemical admixtures do. There's shrinkage reducing admixtures. Like I said, there's air entrainers, water reducers. There's a, a wide technology that's been built around chemical admixtures. This is a mixed design of a typical concrete. You'll notice that we have a certain amount of cement specified. These are in cubic yards. These these numbers. So we have 540 pounds of cement in a cubic yard of concrete in this mix. This is the water. This is the amount of water they'd add at the plant. I don't think that's working. Oh, no. I'm not going to use that. I don't think it's working. So they add 262 gallon or pounds of water. That's in pounds. And they add 1,401 on this aggregate, the 467, and the number eight is blended with it to bring it up to about 1,700. So most concrete has about 1,700 pounds of aggregate coarse, about 1,400 pounds of sand, and it's designed with a certain air content in mind. Thinking, why would we want to add air to concrete? Air doesn't provide any strength. What good would that be? Some projects, air is used to help make the concrete more workable. Air is also very important in a situation where flat works, slabs on grade, are prone to freeze thaw. If you air and train concrete with tiny little bubbles spaced properly, the concrete is durable because the freezing ice has a place to go in the voids. And that's a very powerful advance in concrete is air entrainment. Some slabs don't need it. This particular mix did not. And they give you the density and the mass, the yardage, is shown in the absolute volume down on the bottom. And this is an important number. The concrete petrographer in the lab is always called on to figure out if this number is accurate. The design is a 0.49. That's the water to cementitious ratio. That's a very important parameter we always look at when we're dealing with concrete. As I said, aggregate's the number one mineral industry. Aggregates are the prime ingredient, and they're not just inert fillers. A lot of people say, oh, aggregate is just inert material you bind with cement. Aggregates are very important, and they can be reactive. They can be a problem, or they can be an advantage, depending on how angular they are, what their composition is, and so forth. So aggregate's the number one thing. In the microscope, in the right there, yeah. You can see the picture here is a thin section. 30 micron wafer of sand produced in an epoxy matrix. So we can actually look at the texture and the mineralogy and we can get the mode or the point count volume percent of the components. This is known as a C295. ASTM has all these procedures. 295 is aggregate and fine aggregate is, is shown here in this slide. Here's a limestone down on the lower right. It's a thin section of a limestone. You can see it's made of fossil fragments of, of lime secreting animals. And that's typically what a limestone look like when it's pretty clean. We have also other things we use other than carbonates. The carbonates are limestone and dolomite, but in the industry, there's also granitic rocks and trap rocks, dark, fine grain, dense rocks. But most of what we use in crushing rock is is limestone and dolomite. This dolomite on the right is a, is a specimen of the Thornton dolomite from Chicago. And the lower right shows a thin section, a picture, a 30 micron wafer, showing the tiny dolomite crystals and their open porosity. And so this is the kind of thing we look at in the lab to evaluate these aggregates 
which are the main ingredient in concrete. They can be crushed. The fine aggregate can be also a manufactured or crushed product. There's a wide range of materials that, that are used for aggregates. Sometimes even recycled concrete is broken up and reused. Not as much as you would think, but it's growing. So how do we make cement? Cement is the binder. It's the amazing powder we use. We produce it in these big kilns by taking limestone like this. This is a limestone from the Cincinnati Arch. It's Ordovician in age. It's full of fossils. You can see them obviously, but the main composition is calcium carbonate. That's the lime we need to make cement. About two thirds of the composition of Portland cement is calcium oxide. And so we need a high calcium source for the raw feed. We take those materials and mix some other things in with them in a very tightly specified chemistry. And we introduce it into these kilns, these tunnel kilns. These are some earlier ones. This is a common view at a cement plant of a tunnel kiln. The raw feed goes in at the top end and the fire comes in at the bottom and it tumbles around and heats and finally turns into that magma I mentioned that makes clinker. You'll see the clinkers here in the lower center. That's what it looks like when it comes out of the kiln. It's literally a magma, a liquid that's fused. And in that liquid, these round grains we saw in that one slide of Portland cement that was polished and etched. Those are the grains that do the work, the calcium silicates. Tricalcium and dicalcium silicate are the primary phases. And in the clinker, there's a matrix that was the liquid magma that then consolidated and formed a ferrite and aluminate phase. So there's a pretty complex nature to this cement clinker, and it's a very tightly controlled process. Again, as Ben saw in the, in, the, in the quarry at Portland, his hardened hydraulic mortar looked like the, the limestone at Portland. The early kiln in America is shown on the right in the middle. That was a Pennsylvania producer that was one of the earliest Portland cement producers in North America. And they used a vertical kiln like Aspen. About the turn of the century, the rotary kiln became the standard. It slowly turns, the heat goes up the barrel, the feed goes in, the exhaust goes out, and it produces clinker at the other end. It's, it's a pretty amazing thing. I've seen this at plants. Here's a, here's a quarry producing limestone in Illinois. That's a surface image on the left of a polished limestone from Texas. You can see the 4M fossils in there, sort of floating critters that were in the Cretaceous Sea at the time. And then the Thornton Quarry is on the right. You've seen that specimen before. The high wall is here as you approach the quarry. It's a giant hole in the ground. They've mined a lot of material at Thornton Quarry. In Ravenna, New York, they're producing cement. There's an aerial view of the plant. You can see the kilns right here. These are the rotary kilns that slowly turn and the exhaust comes out here, they feed coal in. It's a wet process kiln where they put water and the raw feed, the raw materials of limestone and other ingredients go in there. They're mining the limestones across the street and they chose the Devonian limestones here at Ravenna because they're dirty. I mentioned earlier, dirty limestones aren't dirty, dirty. They have clay and they have quartz, silt, and other things in them. And so they're, they're already chemically close to the mix we need for the raw feed. And that's the advantage there at Ravenna. You can see a thin section of this New Scotland limestone. It's a Devonian limestone. And you can notice a couple things. The fossils are these wavy lines here. It's a 200 micron bar. So this is a pretty close up view of a thin section. But notice all these lighter areas. I'll use the pointer. See these little grains? These white grains are small quartz silt grains. So a bunch of dirt was going into the basin where this limestone was building up. And the dirt is both clay. The top of that slide shows argillaceous or clayey matrix. And so this, this is a very dirty limestone. You can see in the specimen on the top, the fossils, and then the dark argillaceous or clay nature of that rock. They mine shale. 
that gives them aluminum. Shale is an aluminum rich material. They blend to get the aluminum they need in the, in the raw feed. If they have a little shortness of carbonate, they were fortunate to have a very clean limestone in Ravenna at the top. And you can see in the bottom specimen, this is the B-craft limestone in the Devonian. And this is a thin section of it. And look how different that one looks. Lots of fossils, clean calcite. So that's a very pure calcium carbonate. And they use that to sweeten the raw feed to make the composition exactly what they need. They literally hire geologists in the quarry to spray paint the face to make sure they know where the separations are between Calcburg, New Scotland, and Beecraft. So they have to very tightly control what they're grinding and feeding into the kiln to get the right product. Also on the far upper right, iron comes often from mill scale. They produce iron products. There's a lot of flakes that come off, iron rich scale, and they buy that and they put that into the raw feed when they need more iron. So that's the process of producing. At Clarkdale, an air view of the plant Phoenix Cement is running, and you can see the process. It's a complex sequence of sorting raw materials, blending, taking the right material, putting it in the kiln, and then the final product comes out as clinker, and then they grind it, they blend it with gypsum to control set, and the final powder is stored in silos and shipped by truck and rail. So that's a, it's a complex process. Engineers run the plant and scientists do X-ray fluorescence to monitor the raw feed coming in and the cement coming out. So this tightly controlled product. We do use pozzolans. So I mentioned at the beginning, the Romans only used pozzolans and they activated them with lime. Well, we're activating with Portland cement. It's a very high alkalinity mix, very high pH, and it will literally activate a pozzolan, a glassy material. And we have a lot of them. We use the slag off glass furnaces. We granulate it in water and it makes an amorphous glass. And it's very metastable. So we can use ground granulated glass furnace slag. Fly ash has been used for a long time as a pozzolan. It's the chief pozzolan in concrete. It's no longer available nearly as much as it was as we've moved away from coal fired power. This is the, the future of the pozzolanic world. In this case, a zeolite, a volcanic ash that's been converted at high pH in a geologic environment to zeolite. As x-ray pattern shows the zeolite on the lower right, it's a pure clinoptolite zeolite. And that thin section shows it was an ash. Notice in the slide, these are shards of broken pumice. These are triple junctions and broken cell walls of pumice this was a volcanic glass that got altered in high pH in nature in an alkaline lake. We'll take that and grind it super fine and it actually works as a pozzolan. We said that liquid admixtures are important. They're very big now. They're very important in making concrete stronger, more durable and more economical. You'll notice on the lower right, I mentioned air. This is a slab of concrete polished and it shows an air entrained concrete, a lot of little bubbles. We measure petrographically how small they are, how many they are and how close they're spaced. And that's, that's an air void analysis that's commonly done in evaluating concrete. A lot of times, as I said, they add water at the project. That does a number of things. It doesn't just decrease strength. Often it spirals the air up because an air entraining admixture is designed like the mix for a specific amount of water. And when you add more water on the project, the air content can dramatically increase. And, and that's another thing we look at when we look at hardened concrete. We use water reducing admixtures like the glenium on the top. We use all kinds of strengthening admixtures, viscosity modifying. There's a whole litany of liquid admixtures. The two key ones are air entrainment and water reducing. Water reducers act to disperse cement grains because they'll clump up in water. But when you add the super plasticizer or mid-range, it literally disperses the cement like in a ceramic industry when we disperse clay. It's the same concept. And that allows us to add less water to maintain a workable mix. And that's a huge advantage. The less water you add, the more stronger, durable the concrete becomes. So what is this conversion, this poslanic reaction? 
we're literally taking calcium hydroxide, which is the main hydration product. When we mix fresh concrete, calcium hydroxide or Portlandite is the main soft, weak hydration product. We'd like to remove that and convert it into the CAH gel. I mentioned CSAH gel, calcium silicate aluminate hydrate gel. That's the glue that makes concrete what it is. And you can see this volcanic ash in thin section is a very fine grained glassy material and in cross polar light on the right, the amorphous materials are black. And so you don't see any real crystal material except maybe that one, there's one crystal at the top which is a crystal that was growing in the magma chamber. And it came through and you can see it in cross polarized light. At the bottom, diatomaceous earth is another poslin we use. Diatoms are silica secreting organisms that use solar energy. And some deposits are very pure. It's opal. It's an amorphous, X-ray amorphous silica. And it makes a good poslin as well. This X-ray pattern on the right is, is a meta kaolinite. If we take pure kaolinite clay, china clay, and we roast it up to about 800 degrees, we dehydrate it and destroy the structure, and it's an amorphous poslin as well. And that is a mineral admixture that's sold as a poslin. You'll notice there's only one peak. This is an x-ray pattern that shows an amorphous peak here because there's no real continuous structure in an amorphous material. So the x-ray signature is just a big swollen area. This is a crystal of an of a titanium oxide. Anatase is commonly found in kaolinite. So that's the crystalline phase that's there. This equation is just for the benefit of the engineers here. It's the equation of one X-ray diffraction line. We use X-ray diffraction, von Laue's genius at work, and we look at mineralogy using X-ray diffraction. We're literally taking a copper target hitting it with high energy electrons and it produces the characteristic one and a half angstrom radiation of x-rays and we collimate that into a beam and we get a, a pattern based on the diffraction effect that shows the key peaks of minerals and you see a strip log here shows in this particular class f fly ash there's mostly mullite which is the aluminum silicate that makes china clay so good when you fire it hot enough and certainly in a coal-fired power plant it's hot enough and so we get mollite, we get some other phases in that burn through with the ash. But you'll notice again, most of this x-ray pattern is an amorphous peak. It takes a lot of that to make a little peak. That little hump is a lot of glass. So that's a really good poslin. The glass gets activated at high pH with Portland cement and creates more gel. And so that's the, that's the name of the game. We've come a long way since early man used rock materials to make those tools from the Verde Valley. That one's a salt pick, believe it or not. They used to mine salt over there with these tools. We use the tools of x-ray diffraction and microscopy in petrographic analysis. This is another diatomaceous earth. Here is a picture of a granite aggregate with cross-polarized light. And you can see the, the beauty and the interest of this field of petrography, which is the study and classification of rocks using thin sections. A 30 micron wafer of rock will transmit light. And you can see this interesting pattern here is a microcline, a potassium rich feldspar. And here are other phases in there. Biotite, quartz is the slate gray one down here. And so we can actually tell the mineralogy and the nature of the rock with thin sections. When we look at concrete, we're called on to figure out what happened, who has to pay, what went wrong. Were breaks low? Did it crack? Do we have scaling of the surface, pop-offs? Do we have some problem with dusting? Here in the lower middle, I stayed in Laramie at a bread and breakfast, and this is the owner of the, whoops, I'm messing up. I'm really messing up. There he is. He owns a bed and breakfast and he asked me at, at breakfast, can you look at this concrete? So we got to talking and I went out and he's standing there and you can notice here we have salt scaling. Most of the concrete's okay, but wherever cars parked and salt dripped off, it kicked it over the top. So the concrete was overwatered, it wasn't cured and it was predisposed to scaling, but it took salt to push it over the edge. And that's a common problem. 
salt is a crystallization phase that will bring it off and cause the top to peel away. And so this kind of scaling is very common and it's a very common question for petrographic analysis of concrete. What happened? Why did the concrete show this loss of surface and is not being durable? And so generally the problem is the concrete isn't cured. In order for cement clinker grains to do their work in concrete, they have to hydrate. And generally in a project, they'll walk away here in Prescott, I see it all the time. They'll walk away from the slab and just let it dry right out. And so the moisture is gone from the wearing surface where it's needed the most to convert the clinker into CSH gel. And so if you don't cure concrete wet or hold the moisture in with an admixture, a curing compound, you can have problems like this. We look for cracking, cracking here, plastic cracking occurs when the concrete is still moist enough to be moved, it's plastic. And it dries out like a piece of split firewood and it forms these big wide cracks. Normally you see this cracking in the middle upper, upper top there, that's normal drying shrinkage. Concrete typically dries and shrinks as it cures and it can crack, that's why we cut joints. We either tool joints in the flat work or we cut them the day after we place. And that's done so we can put the crack where we want it because it's going to shrink and dry and crack. If we don't do those saw cuts and we don't do them right, we cut them too shallow, we cut them too late, this kind of pattern in the middle is what we get. It's a very common issue. When we have freezing and thawing of non-air entrained concrete, we see what you see in the lower left. Lift off sections sequentially, half inch, quarter inch, inch. Sections get lifted off and they break free. And that's a, that's a common problem too in areas of freeze thaw. Believe it or not, here in Prescott, we get a lot of freezing and thawing cycles. It cools off at night, it warms up in the day. We have deeper cracks on the right. Often these drying shrinkage cracks may start as a plastic shrinkage crack and then extend through the aggregate even when the concrete gets enough strength. And so we can give some information to the client about timing. Here on the right, on the upper right, this is a phenomenon of alkali silica reaction that causes the concrete to expand. It's literally a reaction between the Portland cement alkalizing the pore solution of concrete and certain siliceous aggregates that are not stable. And so that's a reason why we would evaluate aggregates before they're used in concrete to certify them. This is a long-term expansive reaction due to reactive chert, reactive chalcedony, opal, other things that are deleterious in the long run. And we're always looking when we evaluate a posilanic material for use in concrete as a supplementary cementitious material, we're looking in the x-ray, not for this dust of fracture, which is just mineral grains, has no amorphous material. We're looking for this amorphous signature on the right, which is this material right under these peaks. That doesn't look like much, but that's more than 50% amorphous glass. And so the x-ray shows us what may be likely to be a good poslin. Ultimately, three-day cylinder breaks at 28 days and 56 are the key. That's what a producer will use to, to figure it out. And we have all kinds of problems. You wouldn't think this is true in this day and age. There's an endless number of problems with concrete. It involves too much air, like in the middle, upper middle. Excessive air has no strength. So you reduce the strength when you over air concrete. And that's a, an issue. Most concrete is certified on compressive strength. And so when the brakes are low, somebody's got indigestion. On the left, often we see this. To the uninitiated, that just looks like a bunch of aggregate paste. But you'll notice down here, this dark zone of mortar, that's a relict area in a concavity of a coarse aggregate that shows the earlier time in the mix. And, and a lot of people would say when they went in tours at Master Builders, you can't tell me we added water after the project was long done and hardened. Well, we can. The forensic work often involves a polished slab like this. And we often see these relict veneers of dark mortar. That's the way the mix should have looked. The more water you add, the lighter it gets, the weaker, the more absorptive, the more calcium hydroxide, the more strength loss and durability loss, the more water you add. 
And so this is evidence of the earlier point in the mix where it was as design. And when the project foreman says, hey, give me 30 gallons, the driver's glad to do that. And he signs on the ticket, they now own the load and he adds 30 gallons and what happens? You get a much lighter, softer, weaker concrete matrix. It's inhomogeneous and these relic veneers give away what happened. We look at aggregates and certify them to make sure there's no ASR, alkali silica reactivity potential. And we look at surfaces that are fractured from compressive strength. And here in the lower right, we'll do thin sections of concrete. That's a thin slice. It's not 30 microns like rock. We need that to be 20 because the paste is so detailed and there's so much stuff in it that if you do it at 30 for rock, it's too complex. So this is 20 microns thick. And you'll notice in this concrete, this is a fly ash concrete and the arrows point at these round spheres. These are fly ash glass particles. In added to the concrete, sometimes 25, 30%, half of the concrete powder may be fly ash. And that's a long-term slow posilanic reaction that gains strength and durability way beyond the 28 day. Normally strength is tested at seven, and 28 days. And they use cylinders they make on the project according to ASTM, ASTM procedures, ACI and ASTM. And so they make the cylinders and they break triplicates and they average those. Those are the compressive strength breaks that tell the engineer project whether it's okay. And, and this continues to grow way beyond 28 days. So that's a, that's a, a thin section of concrete we would look at under the microscope. And that is, the end of the line, and I'll take any questions you might have. Anything at all about concrete, why somebody would spend a whole career looking at concrete? I, I have a question. It's yeah. regarding Arcosanti. Okay. Arcosanti used concrete to, it looked like when I was there, to create almost the entire facility. Do you know why? I, I heard that architects from all over come over to look at it. Um, I heard, and I don't know if this was correct, that it had something to do with heating and cooling of the area. Is is Do you have any information on that? I don't have a lot on that, but concrete is a very flexible and versatile material. And because it, it's plastic when it's used, and it can be modified with viscosity modifying admixtures to be workable and hold up as a curbing in, in a paving situation or in, a, in an arch or something, it, it can be formed and made into anything. And so it also has a, a good heat island characteristic unlike asphalt for pavements. It's, it's not building as much heat and holding it. And so, yeah, it, it's a very versatile architectural material and often architectural pieces, panels, facades, precast items, they're looking for extreme whiteness and they'll choose a poslin that maybe is a metacalonite, which is a bright white. It's a little more expensive, but it's a highly active, high quality poslin and it's super white. And so sometimes color is an issue in architectural work, but there's a big distinction between structural concrete, like the Mad Hatter had, the Mad Carpenter had at that Laramie B&B. &B. That was structural concrete. And he asked me, should I tear it out and redo it? I said, you can, but you'll get the same thing. They won't cure it. And the salt scaling will happen again. It drives, it walks, it parks, it's structural and it works. So I wouldn't replace it, I told him. But architectural is another matter. Color matters, staining matters. There's a lot of other details. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just curious, I came here from Michigan and uh, um, what, what we frequently found was um, cut flat work concrete sidewalks and so forth, failing at the control joints. Yeah. Um, the civil engineers would just kind of shrug and call it joint rot. Yeah, uh, yeah. there's a technical term for that, right, right. What, why does that happen? And, and the inside of the slab or the center of the slab would be just fine, but it would yeah. be at the control joint that it would the, fail. The technical term you're referring to is decracking. It's a deterioration at joints and saw cuts where moisture and freeze thaw can actually penetrate into the, the saw cut and the joint. And so you get an extra dose of water pushing it. And typically we have lightweight cherts, so micro silica rocks like porcelainite chert and white chert or ironstone concretions. 
these are microporous to the point where they'll supersaturate and when they freeze, they break. And so that's, that's a term we call decracking. It's very common in the Midwest. Yeah. Bags of uh, cement or uh, bags of concrete, either way, when you, you buy it pre-bagged at yeah. the hardware store or whatever, um, how long is that good for as long as it's kept dry? Like how long is that good for before you add water to it? it it's That's a good question. It's hydraulic. So moisture getting into the bag, those products are normally produced with a paper bag, but it's got a plastic liner. And so they do what they can to keep moisture from getting in. And they have a pretty long shelf life, but they will harden in place. And, and so they can last a year or more, or they can last a few weeks, depending on the situation. If the bag's compromised, there's high humidity, that that's very... The Portland cement is very hygroscopic. It is thirsty and it will draw moisture in and set. It'll literally harden in the bag. And I've had plenty of bags of cement I bought at hardwares and building supply places where the corners are all hydrated and lumpy. Yeah, that happens. And there, as you say, there's also pre-bagged concretes. So they've already added the aggregates, the sands and the gravels, and sometimes admixtures even for air. And so they have all these prepackaged products, mortars, concretes. But Portland cement is the ingredient. That's the main ingredient. You can buy bags of 94 pounds of the size of bag. And also, I was curious, is it possible to, uh, to make concrete heat resistant hot enough to like, let's say, a, a fireplace or a pizza oven? Yeah. In industry, we make steel ladles out of calcium aluminate cement. It's a different animal. It's a completely different product than Portland cement. Calcium aluminate cement is refractory, and they cast castable arches for kilns, brick, ladles for steel production. So yes, you can make a very refractory concrete out of calcium aluminate cements. Um, normal Portland cement is fairly heat resistant as well, because as a fire damages the concrete, it produces an insulating layer, a refractory powder, if you will, of, of destroyed concrete. So it doesn't go very deep. I've seen projects where a massive fire has affected a multi-store building and the concrete's still functional and usable after they clean it and put topping back on it. it it's a pretty refractory material itself. But in industry, when we need high heat resistant components produced as a concrete, we use calcium aluminate cement. So in the Roman aqueduct, the uh, the archways, you know, um, that was early on. <laughs> Let's see if I can go back. It responds a little slow. We can go back to that slide. That's a an aqueduct in France I showed, right. and it it's still standing. And they had been using it up till very recently to transmit water. Get back That's to that slide. There it is. Okay, so those archways, did they pour or did they create the forms to pour it in? Like, or did you know, were they that engineeringly advanced or were those they, they knew that, that the structure of an arch was a stable structure. And so they mm -hmm. precast those blocks and then put them into place. And then they would cast this. So the top, the arch is a precast set of blocks, and they would form that up with lumber and then put that in there with cement grout and cast the blocks and they would cast the concrete in to fill. And then they would build the next layer up on top. So it was a multi-step process, but they only used volcanic ash and volcanic rock fragments. Those can be reactive in an alkali silica reactive sense, but they didn't care because they put so much in, it flooded the system and there's no alkali reaction when you have a huge amount. There's a certain level at which Aggregates that may be expansive can be in concrete. And that's another thing we look at when we do the forensics on aggregates is we're looking at how much of those potentially reactive, expansive aggregates are there. When you have a whole bunch, it doesn't matter. It's not a factor then. And so there, there's where all highly reactive acid volcanic rocks. So they could have, they could have no problems with durability. That's pretty ingenious. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The Romans were <laughs> were very ingenious. Early man, even here in Arizona, was ingenious. It 
everybody's the same. They just had a little different technology than we did. Yeah. Well, I have the microphone. There was a slide where you showed a dam. I think it's. Oh, let's see if we can find it. No, it's not the beginning. Oh, yeah, that was the infrastructure slide. This yeah, is. So, is, did you say that was Davis Dam up in Bullhead? That's what it looks like. What was? Do you know what dam that is? I was Davis Dam. Davis yeah. Davis. Yeah, yeah right. it is. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of concrete dams. There's a special uh, engineering that goes into dams. They use much coarser aggregate and use much less cement because in mass concrete, like in a dam, like I said, if you take your hand and put it in the hollow core to Moline precast in Minneapolis, you'll burn the skin right off your hand. The next day, it's so hot in there. You could cook a turkey in that concrete. It's so hot. And, and that's the kiln heat being released at the exothermic reaction of hydrating the cement. And, and so in mass concrete like dams, they'll often put lines, copper lines in there and cooling water will flow through as it cures. They'll use a much lower cement content, a whole lot more pozzolan to hold down that heat gain. And it's a, it's a big issue in concrete. If it overheats, you can get thermal cracking. And the last thing you want in a dam is cracks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any more questions? Then please help me by thanking John for his wonderful lecture today. Thank you.